How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing better than me. <laughs> um, I'm just having one of those days. It's just not a good day for me. Um, meaning I've spilt everything pretty much except for my coffee so far. <laughs> um, yeah, so I spilt a whole bottle of, uh, you know, my Braille Brown right here. Like just tipped it over. Like uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just an adjustment with age. But you have days, bumper days like that. Uh, like you, you, you know, your dexterity gets tested. That you know the very finesse that young people take for granted when you're just all your senses are, you know, seemingly 100% and everything. And then like when you grow older, your your mind stays fresh and young if you have a good philosophy and about life and so on and you're happy which i am but you're the mechanical begins to fail like your body and stuff i mean i'm still young you know i'm the youth of old age at 60 what am i i can't even remember 62 i think but uh yeah so i thought you know i'm feeling a little bit um flatlined you know so uh, let me just adjust this camera a little bit more it seems to be dipping down um i'm feeling a little bit flatlined and um Like nothing seems to be really working right now. <laughs> um, is that better? Yeah. Anyway, so I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm going to work on the right away, like this section again. Um, so I started adding tufts of grass last night. I, I don't know. I came in and I looked at it. Like you ever get that when you look at your layout and you just think, oh, geez, something's bugging me, right? So I decided that I would do some more work. Uh, I have a really cool photo if I can reach it without yanking my lavalier off my chest. But that would be appropriate though, because that's the kind of day that I'm having. Yeah, it's it's a photo way down there um, of a right away, which you probably can't see very well because of the glare of the camera. But I just got so tired of tweaking everything, you know, and setting everything up. I just thought, you know, I would just do a, like not an editorial, but just a bit of a just a free rant, which can be dangerous, right? <laughs> um, anyway, we all get days like this. And so I started writing things down, like questions and things, you know, because uh, we all need to self-motivate at times. But uh yeah, so I spilt this whole bottle of paint, just tipped it right over, like watched myself do it. Like it was kind of funny, actually. So quickly what I did was to save it. It was down here by this boxcar and like down in here, like this dark brown just flooded everything. So you know what I did is I just took isopropyl alcohol and just poured it on, right? And just spread it around with a brush and feathered it all out. And I thought, hey, you know, that looks random. It looks cool. That'll work. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of what it is, too, when you're doing right-of-way painting like this. Like, I've, this is probably one of my favorite 
parts, right? Like, you know, I just come in, you know, and I just flood in IPA, right? This is no airbrush today work. And actually, you can get stunning results with just a brush, some isopropyl alcohol, and some buffer earth to me. It's one of the original methods that I started on, um, for myself, I mean, on Glover Road, right? And then, like, here's some dark. I had to mix some new stuff because I spilt it all. So you can see you can just sort of drop it in, and it leaves a bit of a stain. But what the IPA does, bring lots in, is it feathers it out so it doesn't look like a hard edge. I mean, you might want a hard edge sometimes. But uh, and a little bit of buff for dried soil looks cool, too. And it blends in to, um, you know, previous staining. It's a it's a form of stain painting, and it works really well for especially when people are just getting into scenery. It's a good fail safe method. You really can't go wrong. Just make sure you have lots of IPA, and don't worry about flooding it into your terrain because even if it reactivates matte medium or glue, uh, it'll all harden back to normal again. That's the beauty of uh, acrylics, right? So yeah, so just feeling kind of bummed a bit and uh, thought, you know what, I'm just going to go back and turn the camera off. <laughs> but then I couldn't turn the camera off because uh, I thought, no, I should film this and share it. So yeah, so I'm going to work this area a bit here and you can see that uh, what I've done is I started adding in more grass tufts. Um, I don't know what it was. I changed the lighting up above in the room or something. It changed the color of some of this grass. It's weird. Uh, so I'm going to redo some of this with the airbrush, this part. But I'm going to stab in some medium green, dark green, light green. You can't, like, let me just turn the camera over here. Like, uh, it's pretty difficult to achieve this in one or two passes. You can't do it, actually. And you can't do it in a week, either. You got to do it over months. Like, you got to lay a layer down, lay another layer down three days later, leave it, go to something else, then come back and look at it, stab in some more, add some ties, leave it, walk. Like, that's the way it is with the shelf layout, I mean. Like, when you're focusing on a smaller footprint and you just want to build a real, like, a small, very immersive kind of layout. Um, you know, uh, you can afford to do this. On a big layout, like a big class one main, like it's not going to happen. I mean, it will if you want to. But, um, you know, you generally want to just get things covered or get things moving. And, uh, you know, so it's different. And big sprawling layouts can look great when you just do a general view because that's how you're viewing the chain, uh, uh, sorry, the trains as well. But there's a few uh, questions that I wrote down here just in closing as a kind of a just a little commentary that I want to raise and just uh, talk about if that's okay all right okay so uh, a couple things I wanted to mention that I don't want to forget. Uh, somebody had mentioned the question, could you list some of your paints? Um, well, I don't want to just put a big long list on one episode of paints and then no one can ever find it. It's all inclusive contextually in the videos. I share the paints. I I'm, I think I'm pretty uh, thorough about that, the paints I'm actually using. But I think for starters, if you want to do terrain like this, apart from green, because you can just lay in the green that's like the static grass scenery, you can lay that in just default colors. You don't really need to paint it, okay? I like to paint it or change it if it bugs me or it's not working right. I like to work on it over a long period of time. Um, so you can see Buff XF57, Flat Earth XF52, and Linoleum Deck Brown. You should have these three colors with flat black and flat white in your terrain coloring to me is, right? And when you mix these and you're doing this with thinner, don't use it straight from the bottle. Turn these into, like, you can buy clear bottles, right? Like the Tamiya, or use another bottle, but try to split these up. Like, try to make four bottles out of each of these, okay? Really, like four, yes. But stir up all the pigment first, 
and then split it up into three or four bottles and then top it up, smaller bottles, top it up with 99% IPA or 50% or whatever. For your terrain, I mean, for doing this, like this kind of thing. Because it goes a long ways, right? And when you spill it, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It's not as painful, right? You know, because uh, it'll happen. But if you're going to spill it, spill it on your right away. <laughs> anyway, that's generally where I spill my paint. But you learn those things <laughs> as you go along, right? Okay. Um, oh, look, since, I mean, I'm having one of those days, right? The battery on my camera's dying. Just let me load up a new battery. Okay, fresh battery, so I'm good for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, oh yeah, so uh, I, I went out the other day and I bought a new tool, like with these pliers. So it's like, I couldn't find my uh, needle nose pliers, right? I need, I was in a real pinch. And you know how it is? I look on my bench and my bench is very modest and fairly organized. Couldn't find them, right? So I was out and about because I had to get a new valve for my uh, compressor or a coupler for my airbrush coupler. And I thought, ah, I'm going to get a pair of channel locks because I love channel locks. They're made in the USA and they're just awesome tools, right? Like I bought this one 30 years ago and I've left it outside and everything. And it works just like new, you know. Don't you love a tool, a good American-made tool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to apologize for that either. But anyway, um, and then these have the cutters on the side. But anyway, I found my pliers. As soon as I brought these home, I looked, the first drawer I opened, there they are. But these are better than the ones I had, if you know what I mean. So I got those. I bought a pair of, uh, like a tool, which I do once in a while. So, um, yeah, you can see the photo down there, the, the right away photo. That's out of a... Uh, uh, prototype uh, rail magazine um i'll maybe i'll list the you know the name down here what it is and the issue and date and everything really nice photographs and that is really inspiring i went through that the other day i was feeling bummed out right and i saw that and i thought hey i'm getting close to that i'm going to rework this over because i really love that look the old switcher there and there's an f unit i think up top coming through it's really nice right away uh, photograph too to be inspired by so a uh, few questions i wrote down that i just want to uh, mention it takes time to build a model railroad so yes right like what's the rush like i notice people do that it's like they just have to build this layout like you know like overnight practically like it must be done in in four months or it must be done in two years really like i don't like i can't relate to that i mean if that's what people want to do that's fine but um yeah, that, that, like, that doesn't register with me. So, like, if you want to do that, blow through and learn something, then look at it from that perspective. If you want to pump out two or three layouts and just sort of, you know, up the skill set and the experience, then yes, right? But if you want to settle in and you built a few layouts, uh, then you probably uh, want to focus in for a longer period of time let me get off this chair it's driving me crazy because nothing's going right right so yeah uh, you can milk the model railroad hobby for a lifetime uh, absolutely you can uh, you can build like even a shelf layout if you really want to uh, if you want to immerse yourself in all aspects of the hobby like for me i could probably spend 10 years just on electronics because that's not my strong suit right I like to keep things simple. I, I have a heavy bus running through this whole layout and I got feeders, everything soldered nicely underneath, probably every 18 inches like overkill, but I'll never, but even if I drop some feeders, I'm not gonna uh, have a dead section, right? That's, I've always done that though. So that's me. And then, you know, I wanna do signal on section three and other stuff. So I'll, you know, I'll dive into that and ask around and learn that part. But yeah, so, um, don't bite off more than you can chew. Be careful about project creep, right? So that can erode away, right? Like that can be distracting. Now, if you want to be distracted and you want to do another subject, remember, then do it. By all means, do it. Uh, because if your main primary focus is your model railroad, anything you do that is 
tests your challenge uh, or, or, or challenges your integrity or, or, or modeling ability and brings increase to education, inspiration, you know, dexterity, whatever, it's all going to translate into the immediacy of the model railroad when you come back to it. Okay. Uh, the skill set keeps improving when we cultivate praxis or practice, right? So practice. So I don't feel like it today. And uh, but I thought, you know, I'm going to turn the camera on, but no, maybe I should share this and try to encourage some people, even though I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I, I did. So I'm kind of forcing myself and now I'm getting back into it again today. Like I'm really excited about just doing some of this here and and just kind of having a laid back day because of all the architecture and other stuff I've been building. This is kind of relaxing for me. OK, so praxis, but don't make it a, a undesirable practice. But do something different that'll re-inspire you, okay? Uh, all This is a little bit maybe not specific to what I'm sort of dealing with right now, but all operations are a condensed sandbox at the end of the day. They really are. Like, I, like people have are really into operations, et cetera, et cetera. But it's going to be different for every layout, right? There's no one better way. It's whatever suits your, you know, uh, philosophy, within the hobby of model railroading. Like, just because somebody wants to run big, long class ones into staging and run them out and do, you know, last mile, whatever, do whatever you want, right? And don't sweat all that stuff. Because at the end of the day, it's about having fun. And if having fun is just planting tufts of grass, like today, or doing this, then it's, then the model railroad is successful for you, right? Okay. Um, when it comes to model railroading, the younger generation should be constantly pushing the art form. So that's like that applies to me too. But I think for the younger generation, you should constantly be pushing it. Push the art form because it's going to be good overall for the collective hobby and for those around you. Whether you're in a club, whether you're a lone wolf, whatever, if you're a social media guru, whatever, you should be pushing the envelope, right? Whether it's electronics. Uh, building structures, uh, we all have our opinions on the, well, we all have our opinions on everything, but, d but don't go soft on yourself. Like, don't go soft about it. Like, express your opinion. And if you feel strongly about it and you have good reason for what you do, like, let's say the way you do something or why you do it, well, then that's good enough. But don't apologize for it just because somebody challenges you on it, right? Stick to your guns, right? If it works and if it brings you joy and satisfaction, then that's what you should do. Because five years down the road, you might approach it differently. You might change, you might evolve, you might mature in different areas and say, well, that was a good method, but I like this method or that method or whatever. So I have a basic foundation of methodology, but I'm always open to things. I don't change too much because this works for me, but you should be open. And, um, you know, if it brings you more success i guess if i can use the term and that's different for everybody so yeah so now i feel better <laughs> so yeah that's what i'm going to do so if you're feeling a little flatlined or bummed out uh try something different you know or go back to an area and rework an area and ask yourself like take notes say okay why 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 do i not like this like what's bugging me right is it color is it texture what is it you know, um, but anyway, have fun uh, above all and uh, happy modeling to all of you. And I hope that you all have a great day.